Good morning. Um, Daniel, I was speaking to a friend of mine in England last week who said, uh, how will you address Daniel? And I said, well, Daniel. And he said, but he's got a Nobel Prize. And he thought that maybe you've got a title like your Noble Highness. So, how should we address you? Is it Daniel? Danny. Danny. <laughs> I'm not sure I could be that informal yeah. just yet. But then you, you moved back to uh, Palestine after D-Day and the war finished. And, and it's interesting, it says um, on NobelPrize.org, it says, the move to Palestine completely altered my experience of life, partly because I was held back for a year and enrolled into the eighth grade for a second time. I don't think you were in, held back because you were slow. Um, but, it, but why, it seems immaterial, but why did that get a mention? Why was that so? Well, um, I was very weak physically as a child. And, and I was younger than the others in France. And I looked very Jewish. And I felt very Jewish. And, uh, and I was absolutely inept at anything physical. And then we moved to Israel. I was held back. And no longer was I the smallest or the weakest yeah. in the group. And, and that really improved my life a lot. So. Yeah. Um, Yes. So it's always best to be the oldest kid in class, you think? It's, you know, certainly many people say that it's better for the children to be the oldest in the class rather than the youngest. And that, you know, I would say that was true for me. Yeah. And you then went to Hebrew University where you studied, surprise, surprise, psychology. Um, but pretty soon after that, you got enrolled into the Israeli Defense uh, Forces where you ended up in the psychology department. And I understand one of your early encounters into leadership was you were using some, you were forced to use some dodgy British um, uh, leadership identification system left by the British in World War II. What was that about? Well, um one technique they had to select officer candidates was a, so, a so-called field test. And uh, <clears throat> you would bring in people in groups of eight and no insignia of rank, so candidates could be sergeants and, and privates and so on. And there'd be eight of them. You'd have them pick up something that basically is like a telephone pole. And you, they would confront, uh, they would be in face of some obstacle say a wall, and they would be told, your task is to get to the other side of the wall without touching the wall and without the pole ever touching the ground, and the pole cannot touch the wall either. So go. And with, this is a leaderless situation, and some people take over, and some, and you really, as we watched it, the thing that was very impressive was that we had an impression that we really saw the character of these people. You know, it's one of those very stressful situations. And you had the sense that their true nature was open to us. And we wrote with great confidence our predictions of how well they would do as in officer training school. But in fact, we also knew, because we were getting statistics reliably, you know, periodically, we also knew that we were completely incapable of predicting what would happen to those people in, in officer training school. So what was happening? We knew that in principle that our predictions was, were useless. But when we were in the field looking at those sweaty soldiers trying to go over the wall and struggling for control and, and some of them brave and others not and so on, we felt we knew them. And so there was a disconnect between the feeling that you know and, and the reality that you were also aware of peripherally that you can't know, that what you're seeing is really an illusion. So that was the beginning of my work, actually, on, on uh, cognitive illusions. And I invented a term. I, I called it the illusion of validity. And it's the illusion that you know something that, in fact, you know you don't know. And, and it happens in a lot of professions, I think. I'll give you an example. Many people in Wall Street, in the investment industry, they know that they cannot guess which stocks will do better than which others, because, in fact, people can't. But they have the illusion that they can. 
they have stories and the stories are compelling and they believe the stories so they believe they, they know that this is a good stock and this is a bad stock. But they also know that they can't, that nobody can tell which is a good stock and which is a bad mm. stock. So that's the illusion of validity. It, it happens in a lot of places where you, you know, you have that feeling of knowing things that in fact you can't know. So that's a cognitive illusion. Talking about cognitive illusions, can we have our first slide, please? Um, Daniel, if you just talk us through that, just for a second. Well, that's not a cognitive illusion, that's a perceptual illusion, but everybody who looks at this uh, thinks that, or sees the, the lower bar as longer than the, the top one. Everybody does. Now, you know that they're equal, and it's quite easy to show that they're equal. You can measure them. But now that you know that they're equal, it doesn't help you. You still see them, one as longer than the other. So in a way, it's related to what I was saying earlier. That is, you know something, but it doesn't control your experience of it. Mm. There is a disconnect between experience and knowledge. And a very similar thing with that with that illusion, that's a very powerful illusion. You ask people, what is the size of these individuals on the screen? So I'm not asking you how tall they are. Mm -hmm. I'm asking you how tall they are on the screen. And people think that the one on the right is about twice as tall as the one on the left. Now, in fact, they're identical. So it's a complete illusion. They're identical, and the reason we see it that way is that we see the scene as three-dimensional, and as three-dimensional, if that were a photograph of a three-dimensional scene, then indeed the individual on the right would be taller than, than the other two. But notice the following. We would ask about the size of the individual in 3D, we're asked, how tall are they on the screen? So we're asked one question, but we answer another. And that, again, is something that happens all the time. The substitution of an easy question, a natural question, when you're, uh, in fact, asked one that is quite difficult. So mm. I use those examples because in the domain of cognitive illusions, we get the same thing. Brilliant, and it's called, the posh word for that is heuristic, is that right? Which? A heuristic, when you replace a complex yeah. question with an easy question. When I think about, you know, many of you may have heard the word heuristic, but in judgmental heuristics, as I understand them, is simply the substitution of an easy question for a hard one. So here you are, you're asked a question that you cannot really answer, and an answer comes to mind to a question that is not the same one you were asked. Can I give you an, an example? Yes, of course. I'll, I'll give you an example, which actually is my favorite example of how cognitive illusions work. And, and it essentially works on everybody. So I'm going to tell you a fact about Julie. Julie is a graduating senior at a university. And the one fact I'm going to tell you is that she read fluently when she was four years old. And the question is, what is her GPA today? And now, the interesting thing is that, I'm not going to test, to test you, but everyone has a number. A number popped into your head. And now we know exactly how that number came into your head. So let me tell you how we know and, and how it came into your head. When I tell you about Julie, she read at age four, she clearly is, she read faster than the average child. So you get an impression of how precocious she was. And for simplicity, it's actually not the way the mind works exactly, but it's equivalent to it. What percentile is she on reading, on reading age, and maybe she's at the 95th percentile. 
So you get that impression of extremeness. She is extreme, not very extreme, but extreme. She's at the 95th percentile. Now we also know, all of us, we've been around, and we know the meaning of GPA. So we have an impression of what is the 95th percentile of GPA. And the number that came to your mind when I asked about GPA is the same percentile that you would assign to uh, how precocious she was when she read. Mm. So notice how this works. Absolutely. You get one impression. I asked you about her GPA, but you're not really telling me about her GPA. You're telling me about how precocious she was. You're evaluating the evidence. You're not answering the question. Yeah. And that happens automatically. And it happens unconsciously. Nobody is really aware of how that number pops in their head. But that's the way the number comes. And that's the substitution. That's what we call heuristic. In many cases, we don't have as well developed a story about what happens in your mind when you make a mistake. But this is a very clear case where we do know. And, and it involves a funny thing that we don't really think about. We're all equipped, well, there are games we play that use this. We're all equipped in our brains with a machine that can match intensities. So, you know, if I asked you, uh, how large a family would, would have to be to be as large as Julie was precocious in her reading. You also know. You have a number. So we have an ability to match from one thing to another. Mm. Without, you know, that comes immediately. I mean, you know that four children isn't enough for how fast she read. And 12 children is probably too much. So right. uh, actually, Another thing is that people here would agree quite closely on Julie's GPA and would agree quite closely on the size of the family because there are cultural stereotypes for how extreme things are. We're all aware of these things, of the size of families and, and the, you know, the, the age at which people read, how tall buildings are. And we use those statistics to go from one thing to another and from one question to another. So when we are asked a question, we answer another one, then we use that matching machinery and we answer the question without knowing that we answered a question we were not asked. So that's, that's the basic phenomenon of heuristics. And that's, that's why my boss gets so annoyed with me not answering the question. Can, we, can I just ask everyone in the room, who has actually read Daniel's book, Thinking Fast and Slow? OK, who hasn't read the book? OK, and who's currently reading the book? Ah, oh, that's it. <laughs> OK, and who doesn't know what book we're talking about? <laughs> OK, so, so if we can, for those who haven't read it or are currently reading it and haven't got to it yet, um, could you just elaborate? I know you've been asked this millions and millions of times, Daniel, but it is core to the book. System one, system two, just very briefly. Well, uh, the book is about two forms of thinking, and it's in the title, Thinking Fast and, and Thinking Slow. And thinking fast is when things come to your mind quickly. So in the examples I gave you, things came to your mind. Uh, you know, I, I said, Julie, you got, the, you got her GPA. That's fast thinking. Yeah. And the way our memory works delivers, our memory delivers fast thoughts. We interpret situations, we recognize situations. It takes us very little time to do that. This is fast thinking. Then there is slow thinking, which is reasoning and thinking more carefully about things and going sequentially from one idea to its consequences. And most of us, as we experience ourselves, we experience ourselves, it's the slow thinking that we experience. We feel that we are reasoning people. We feel that we have reasons for the things we believe in. Uh, 
we feel that we're conscious of, of our thoughts and our ideas. But the theme of the book is that there are those two systems, system one, the fast one, system two, the slow one. And quite often, system two thinks it's in charge or thinks it has reasons for what it's doing. But in fact, it's system one whispering an answer and system two accepts it. So to give you an example, that happened to you with Julie. This was a system one answer. You didn't really bother to ask yourself, isn't it a bit extreme to predict that she'll be, say, in the 95th percentile at Yale just because she read fluently at age four? I mean, how much do we know from reading at age four? How, why, why do we think we can predict so much? None of that came to your mind as a question. You just trusted your intuition. I'll give you another example of that, very well-known one uh, by now to many people. A bat and a ball oh, together. I've got this, Daniel, on here. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, a bat and a ball together cost a dollar ten. The bat costs a dollar more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? Now, what's interesting about this problem, don't bother trying to solve it. Uh, what, what's interesting about the problem is that the number came to everybody's mind, and it's 10 cents. I mean, the problem is designed to create that association that 10 cents comes up. Now, 10 cents is wrong. And if you check it, you'll see it immediately. 10 cents and a dollar 10 is a dollar 20. So that can't be the answer. The answer is 5 cents. But the reason I use the problem so often is that 50% of Harvard students, when you ask them that question, put 10 cents as an answer. Now, what happens to them? We know they didn't check, because if they had checked, they would find the answer. They trusted their system one. So you get answers, you trust them, and I call that endorsing. System two endorses an association as if it was a reasoned response. Mm. People think they have solved the problem, but in fact, they're reporting an association. But if system one can give the wrong response, and system two is cognitive strain, so we don't want to go answer this question by thinking about it, we just want to go with the first response, then isn't, haven't we defaulted to system one because we are time poor, potentially mentally inherently lazy, and also because our organizations have been taught that to survive in this day and age as a leader or as an, indiv or as an organization, you've got to be fast and nimble. They talk about survival of the fastest now. Does that I mean, play against system two? You know, we are not, uh, we're not very deliberate about this most of the time. I mean, most of the time, we have to go with system one. You know, we walk, we cross the street, we talk to people. Most of that is done with very little thinking. Even, even routine conversation is done with minimum amount of you know, pondering, should I be saying this or should I be saying something else? When you're talking to your boss about asking for a raise, you know, that's when system two is really in charge. Otherwise, most of the time, we act a lot automatically. Mm. Uh, and we don't choose to do that. That's the way we're, we're built. It would be too costly to think about everything. If you just imagine somebody, somebody was thinking about everything, he couldn't move. He would be paralyzed. So we must trust this the one. The point or the real issue is whether you can tell or recognize situations in which system one is likely to make a mistake. If you can recognize situations where system one is likely to, to make a mistake, you've got it made. Because once you know that you're susceptible to a mistake, you slow yourself down. And, and there are mistakes that you can learn to recognize that you are going to make. And, and in fact, most of us have that in some cases, you know. Oh, if I say that to my spouse, we're going to spend the whole evening quarreling, 
and then you decide not to, that is recognizing a situation where you're inclined to make a mistake and stopping yourself. And we can do that at many different levels. And when we're truly sophisticated about this, we can recognize our cognitive mistakes and stop ourselves in some cases from making them. I'm not very optimistic about that, but uh, because it, I'm not very good at, at stopping my own mistakes, so I don't, I don't expect others uh, to be very good either. Yeah, because you actually mentioned it on an interview with Charlie Rose. He, he, Charlie asked you the question, um, what, what do you feel about that? What's your intuition on that? And you said you don't trust your intuition. Is that where we've yeah. ended up? The, but you are not, would you trust your intuition if I was asking you something about something in your expertise, though? Is expertise-loaded intuition different to something you don't know about? Well, when I'm interviewed by Charlie Rose, it's like talking to the boss. I mean, you know, so I'm thinking, and, and then I know I shouldn't trust my intuition, and that's the answer I give him. But, but in fact, most of the time, you know, like everybody else, I trust my intuition. Yeah. Is there any way that we can improve our system one um, accuracy, becoming an expert in your field, for example? Because well, it is <coughs> expertise or expert intuition is something that exists. I mean, so I'm not denying expert intuition. Chess players have it. Uh, firefighters have it. There is a psychologist named Gary Klein, who is sort of a friend and an enemy of mine. <laughs> uh, he, he is an intellectual adversary, really is. Uh, he has written some very, very good books that take essentially the opposite position than I do on almost everything. So he is a great believer in people's intuition. And the whole notion of bias, he sort of gets the shivers where, where he hears words like cognitive illusions and so on. He wants to believe in expertise. And <clears throat> we wrote a paper that took us six years trying to see if we really disagree or trying to map out when can you trust expertise and when can't you. And eventually, after six years, we wrote a paper called a failure to disagree. We, we agreed, but actually we agreed about what are the conditions under which you can get expertise. True expertise, intuitive expertise, the expertise of a chess master or of a firefighter who has intuitions about how the fire is going to go. It's years of practice and it's a very rapid feedback. If you get immediate feedback on your actions and you have a lot of practice, you will become intuitively expert. But th that is rare. Most professionals don't have that expertise, that uh, opportunity to develop an expertise. So what you have is a lot of people who have a lot of confidence in their judgment but they're not true experts. Now, I should add that just this week, Gary Klein and I are having a furious email exchange uh, in which we are this, uh, you know, competing on what the statement that we fail to disagree in really means. You know, it turns out he interprets it one way and I interpret it another <laughs> way. Uh, Can you forward that to us? It'd be fantastic to have, mm. have, have a read. Um, talking about disagreements there, um, in that interview with Charlie Rose, which I thoroughly enjoyed, by the way, um, all these questions are not exactly ripped off from Charlie Rose, but um, you talk about uh, Malcolm Gladwell's book, Blink, um, and his title is, it's not all in here, but it says, Blink, the power of thinking without thinking. So that's kind of exactly opposite to what you're, I mean, that must be sacrilegious for you to hear that, right? I'm almost. Sacrilegious, I mean, one. you know, he is, he is right in a way. I mean, there is chess masters blink. You know, they see a chess situation at a blink. We can, all of us, have that kind of intuitive expertise in social situations. We can walk into a room and know they've been talking about me. You know, that's something we pick up. That's expertise. Mm. 
you know, I can talk to my wife and one word on the telephone, and I know, and I know something about her mood. I'm an expert. Uh, that kind, of, that kind of expertise certainly exists. What I thought Malcolm was doing, he was overdoing it. He was going way too far, suggesting that there is that sort of magical intuition. And he starts out with the example of a lot of people looking at a particular sculpture and, and feeling that it's a fake without being able to tell why they feel that it's a fake. And, he's, and he gives the impression, you know, very sure, that they must be right because they all agree on that conclusion, although they don't know why. Yeah. And I should add that here, Gary Klein and I both agreed. You can't be sure. Right. Maybe they are, maybe all these experts are wrong. Because in principle, if you have that feeling, you ought to be able to figure out why. Yeah. There is a reason you have that feeling, and you can analyze it. And if you can't, somebody else can. Well, there's a danger, I suppose, also that uh, people think they're the experts, but they're actually the fools. Yeah. And does that feel any different if you have an intuition that's based on expertise versus based on ignorance? Is no. The, that's the real tragedy of it, is that the confidence you feel when you're acting as a real expert and the confidence you feel when you're answering the wrong question mm. are the same. Uh, you cannot trust... Well. Let's do the easy part first. You cannot trust other people just because they are confident in what they tell you. Now, the hard part is you can't trust yourself either. And, that, you know, that's harder. But it's just remember that, that the fact that somebody is genuinely, sincerely confident in what they say is not a guarantee of accuracy. The example I'm thinking of these days a lot is I'm thinking of astrologers. Don't ask me. It started in that conversation with Gary Klein. And astrologers had reputation. You had expert astrologers. Now, we know now that all this is garbage. I mean, there's nothing to astrology. And yet, they established professional reputation. They impressed each other. They impressed other people. This may be happening today. And it may be happening to the people that you're talking to. They may be astrologers. Mm -hmm. So knowing when you can trust people's confidence and when probably you can't, mm -hmm. that's useful. And let me tell you in a sentence what the key is. The key is not to look at the person's confidence, at the person's confidence. The key is to ask, how did the person learn to do what they're doing, to say what they're saying? And did, did the environment offer them an opportunity to learn that is as good mm -hmm. as the environment of learning to play chess, where you really can develop intuition? And it's very much the same thing as looking at a piece of art and trying to evaluate a piece of art, actually, many experts know that looking at a piece of art is not the best way to evaluate it or to decide whether it's genuine. You have to check the provenance. You have to check where does it come from. And when you are trying to evaluate the quality of very confident people, you have to ask, where did they learn? what they pretend to know? And could they really have learned what they pretend to know? And sometimes you will find that they can't, that they're deluding themselves and are trying to delude you. 
On Malcolm Gladwell, we've got some uh, we've got some good news for you, Daniel. I was going to ask you which one of these would you prefer, but I don't think we've got time for that now. But the bottom one, which is yours, uh, has got 2,224 reviews, slightly less than uh, Malcolm Gladwell's. But the good news is that people are holding on to your books, 137 used for $4.17 on the reseller market, and they're trying to get rid of Malcolm Gladwell's. <laughs> <laughs> so that's good. You can see I haven't got Malcolm. If Malcolm was here, it would be a different story. Yeah, but. I'm sure. <laughs> Another one uh, that you talk about is jumping to conclusions that we do, which is, I, I think, uh, very dangerous. Just before we move on, system one, system two, is there anyone or any organization that you think has got a good balance of system one and system two? For example, uh, Hillary Clinton, Donald Trump, do they personify a good balance in your opinion? <laughs> well, you know, that one is too easy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a shame it's too easy, isn't it? But but there is something to be said here, which is, if you compare President Obama to George W. Bush, mm. many people comment that if you ask the relative balance of system one and system two in those two individuals, it's very clear. There's much more system two deliberation in President Obama and much more acting on my gut and trusting my gut in George W. Bush. I'm not going to discuss Trump. Right. But, uh, but the interesting thing is that people, this in some ways is a weakness politically for President Obama. People actually like their leaders to be decisive. They like their leaders not to deliberate too much. They like their leaders to know the answer right away. Mm. In short, People like intuitive leaders, and they trust them. And that is a very odd thing, that, but, but clearly quite powerful. And again, you can see that what gives us an impression of strength, what gives us an impression of leadership, you know, somebody who sort of seems to hesitate too much and dither and not decide and ask lots of people or somebody who knows the answer right away. And we have an image of leadership and that image is biased, I think, towards impulsive leadership, yeah. uh, intuitive leadership and against sort of let's slow down guys, let's, you know, uh, the, the Obama motto is, is interesting that way, and it is, let's not do anything stupid. You know, this apparently is a phrase he uses a lot. Yeah. That is a system two phrase. Let's not do anything stupid. You know, let's slow ourselves down. It is not a phrase that, you know, uh, quite a few other people would use, and it has its political costs. It is not, you know, just an asset to think that way. Yeah. Can you just talk um, very quickly uh, about this, uh, ABC 12, 13, 14, um, and why it's, how it's an example of how we can jump to conclusions? Well, um, this example you know, what's notable about it is that we read A, B, C, and we re read 12, 13, 14, but the B and the 13 are actually physically identical. So what happened? What happened is known as a context effect. We have letters on the left side, we have numbers on the right side, and we don't even entertain the possibility of reading A13C or 12B14. There is, and that's system one, because that's associations. The context determines how we think. Yeah. The other example, Anne approached the bank. How do you hear that? Well, what do you see? You typically see Anne some woman approaching a building, you know, with, with tellers in it, presumably, or at least ATMs. My tellers are gone from my bank. Uh, the, 
But there is another way of reading that. In the context of fishing, an approach to the bank means something entirely different. So context and associations determine how we interpret situations. And what's interesting about these examples is that it doesn't occur to us that what we see is ambiguous, that there is another way of interpreting reality. When we have an interpretation of reality, it suppresses its alternatives. So there is one view. I think. Uh, also, in your book, you talk about this rather awkward acronym YSIATI, which is uh, yeah. what you see is all there is, which is jumping to conclusions. But one of the things I read in the book, which really uh, concerned me, which was um, your representative heuristic, when uh, effectively, if we're in a busy environment, time poor, you'll replace, as you were saying before, a harder question with an easy one. So uh, is this person in front of me going to be a good leader? And if why, what's the specifics? We'll replace with, do they look like a good leader? And then you would get into a whole concern about stereotypes. And in a world where it's been proven that gender equality at the top equates to better bottom line, how do we get rid of this unconscious bias? I mean, is this going to, is it solvable? It's, it's extremely difficult. But uh, the point is, when somebody shows up to talk, you know whether he looks you know, impressive. That is something we know immediately. We know it for free. Then if we ask the question, how good a leader is he, there is something related that we already know. And that's when substitution occurs. You use what you know to answer the more difficult question of whether he is a good leader. Mm. That jumping to conclusions, one of the themes of the book and of my thinking generally is about narratives, which again is a word that I'm sure you've been using a lot. And system one, if you will, associative memory, tells us stories. It's not that we construct those stories deliberately. The way we see the world, how we interpret events, that's a story. And it's a story that, that occurs to us automatically. We don't usually, we don't consciously construct it. So this storytelling is a great deal of how we think. And we construct stories out of very little information. So one of my favorite examples is um, I'm going to tell you about someone who is a leader of a country that mm. uh, she is intelligent and strong. Now, is she a good leader? And we already have an answer. You know, that's, she sounds pretty good. Now, the word that I was about to say and didn't say is that she is corrupt. You know, that would have been the third word. Now, clearly, you jump to conclusion after the first two. You know, when I tell you about somebody that they're intelligent and strong, that is very, that's not enough information to know whether they're good national leaders. Mm. It takes more. But we tell ourselves a story, that is the essence of jumping to conclusions. That the amount of information that we have is sufficient to construct a story. And confidence, what I was saying earlier, how confident do you have a right to be? Confidence is a feeling. And the feeling is associated with how good a story you have managed to construct. If it's a good, coherent story, you have confidence in it. If there are contradictions in the story, you are shaky, you have doubts. But mostly, we try to achieve coherence in our stories, and we try to be confident. And mostly, we're confident even when we're wrong. Even on that question about how to spot leaders in the interviews, you come up with a formula of six things to look for. And it's interesting uh, how, to, uh, how you talk about um, ways to overcome some of these unconscious biases and these uh, cognitive illusions, um, where you talk about formulas and algorithms. Um, and 
It's interesting, you say that um, even in marriage, and whether marriage will last or not, you'd prefer to listen to a formula or an algorithm than to an expert. It says here that you, you'd prefer to rely on Robin Dawes' formula, which predicts as a formula, frequency of lovemaking minus frequency of quarrels. Well, it's actually, I mean, you can imagine that, that it's, the expression was not quite as polite. Uh, it, it involves two words, both starts with F. <laughs> so, we, but, you know, it's a, it actually turns out to be highly predictive of marital stability. Just the difference between those two. But. <laughs> We've got a, uh, just a few more qu um, minutes, and I've got about 1,266 questions. So um, just I'll turn it to sort of quick fire, quick questions, quick answers. Um, we interviewed uh, a guy called Mike Lynch, uh, who founded Autonomy and sold it to Hewlett Packard for 11 billion, not enough to live on, but not bad, um, where he said, talking about the future, machines don't sleep, they don't get bored, they don't need holidays, they're gonna change the world. Um, if we're looking into the future, 10 to 20 years out, artificial intelligence, machine learning, do you, what, I know you don't like predicting the future per se, but what do you think is gonna change in the next 20 to 30 years? I mean, you know, I, I don't believe in forecasting, but some things are already happening. I mean, artificial intelligence is something that's happening. Yeah. And so, you now have uh, computerized assistants for physicians who are actually better diagnosticians than the physicians. You have computerized ways of reading uh, x-rays, which are more accurate than radiologists. Mm. Uh, with big data, we're going to have, we're going to develop sensitivities. You know, for example, Picking up lying from faces, it turns out that, um, that when Google put in many thousands of faces known to lie or to be honest, then the computer, the analysis of big data came up with features that people had never thought about as predicting lying. Mm. So all of this, that's the biggest thing that's happening, I think. You know, the, among the important events of this year, there is a computer, I mean, several computers actually, but uh, that beat the world champion at Go. Now, Go is immensely more complicated than chess. And it was thought that that would take at least a decade in the future. It happened this year. So the, the rate at which this is happening is remarkable. And it would change the world, no question. In your interview with uh, Yuval Harry, where you interviewed him, uh, where that uh, interview got turned into a transcript with the title, When Death Becomes Optional, I'd, I'd like to opt out. Um, you say- so my, my expression. Yeah, he says, um, the problem post this revolution when machines take over, he says the problem is more about boredom and what to do with these people and how will they, how will they will find some sense of meaning in a life where they b basically become worthless. My best guess at present is the combination of drugs and computer games as a solution for most. I mean, well, this isn't the uh, future, right? let me tell you who we're talking about here. Uh, who has read the, word, the book Sapiens? Go out and buy it. I mean, this is, this is the best book I've read in years. It's called A Short History of Humankind. And it's, it's by a brilliant young Israeli historian. And so that was his first book, and he's now written a second book, which is about the future. And, okay. uh, and he talks about, about the fact that, you know, there are many people in Silicon Valley who are investing heavily in not dying. You know, in attempting mm. to protect themselves from death. That's, uh, he believes that, you know, he believes that in the next century, basically, a lot of things are going to happen. That his next book is called Homo Deus. That, uh, in a way, going to turn humans into gods. Uh, that's some humans, because that's the point that he is making, is going to be, in his view of the world, tremendous inequality. But whether or not you agree with him, the book Sapiens is strongly recommended. 
I've got three final questions. Number one, your book talks about obviously how lazy our system two is. Um, I interviewed um, uh, Daniel Goldman and Edward de Bono, and Edward de Bono was, and both of them were saying that generally um, there's not enough thinking going on. Uh, Edward de Bono is absolutely key and, uh, and clear that in business we only really use problem solving and thinking when we're, sorry, we use um, thinking properly when we're problem solving as opposed to goal attainment. So is there generally, you think, a lack of thinking within business and leaders? Oh, I, th you asked me earlier about what can be done, you know, to improve people, to avoid cognitive illusions. And, and I indicated that I'm really not optimistic about self-help. Uh, you know, that people can make themselves a lot better. Organizations, that's something else. I think organizations can be a lot smarter than they are. And it's a matter of very thoughtfully designing procedures to guide the thinking of people. Because organizations, there is a lot of room for slow thinking mm. and for checking the quality of the evidence on which decisions are based. I mean, so organizations can do it, and not many actually do it. Yeah, and what can organizations, if people listening to this think we can turn this into a competitive advantage if we can actually embrace your, thing, your work in our organizations, what practically can they do apart from the C-suite or reading your book? Uh, I think reading the book by itself is going to accomplish nothing. It's, it's a way of, let me give you a, you know, a trivial example. How do you run meetings? I mean, you know, people spend their lives in meetings. Meetings are tremendously inefficient. It would be, and they're inefficient because most people come unprepared. They learn about the topic while the meeting is going on. To make a meeting efficient, you would want people to be prepared and to have an opinion before they start. Then something else would happen, which is absolutely key to good thinking. You would get the benefit of independent thinking. That is, when individuals prepare for a meeting and reach their own conclusion, that's very different from a group deliberating. There's going to be a lot more disagreement when people think on their own, and that is healthy. Groups tend to reach agreement too quickly. And my recipe for you know, improvement is not abandon intuition, it's delay intuition. Delay intuition, delay an intuitive solution to the problem until all the information is in. Slow yourself down, look at the various facets of the problem independently of each other, and then look at the problem globally and have an intuition. That's the way to do it. Very few people do it that way. This is real discipline. But an organization could impose this as a procedure for important decisions. You don't want to mess around with unimportant decisions. But for important decisions, you want to have a process. And you want to have a process that will protect you from mistakes. And those are not all that difficult to design. And that's a great point to end up on. I've got a lot, of, lot more questions, but I would love to hand it over to our WhipSmart audience. Daniel, thank you, sir, very much for that interview. Uh, just real quick, uh, the last comment that you made about meetings. I always think about this because I, I run a company, and I think we get in here, we're all unprepared but we come to a group decision within maybe a half hour, 45 minutes of what we're gonna do. Um, if everybody comes prepared, let's say we have eight people, and they're spending an hour or two or three thinking of all the different scenarios that could play out, aren't we wasting and being even more inefficient with our time? Well, I mean, it, it really depends how important the decision is and whether you want, uh, and whether you want to discuss it in a meeting. Many meetings are too large. 
you know, does everybody need to be involved? I mean, many of the meetings have a function that everybody gets informed or feels that they have a stake in the decision, but they're not, the purpose of the meeting among other, is not only social, it's to achieve a good decision. And to achieve a good decision being prepared in advance is a fairly good idea, I think. Thank you for that question. Next, the lady down here, second table from the front. Thank you. Hello. Um, I had wanted to ask about kind of system one versus system two versus kind of maybe a neuroscience principle of like kind of more emotional versus more rational thinking. And there's some literature and point of view out there that one actually inhibits the other. So if you get in a real rational train of thought, you can't kind of flip over to a more emotional reaction and vice versa. So if you get rooted in one of those trains, um, specifically thinking about business and work and maybe when things are going bad, you might get really into an emotional train and really dependent on heuristics because you're trying to find a, a quick answer. How do, you, how do you transition between the two? Well, you know, the only advice I have about, about this is that you have to recognize situations in which you're likely to make a mistake. That's, that's the only thing that you can do. Most of the time, you have to trust yourself. But I'll give you an example. Uh, all of you, you saw that illusion with the two arrows. When you see the two arrows again, you'll know, in this situation, I cannot trust my eyes. I can't trust my vision. You have to measure to be sure. So there are situations that you should know where you are likely to make a mistake. And then system two may be better than system one. That's, that's the best advice I can give. You can't really control how the two works. The, there, are few, there are few levers that you have in controlling your individual thinking. And slowing yourself down is one of those. Um, and that has to be used judiciously because uh, you don't want to be paralyzed either. Any other questions? Uh, thank you very much. Thanks for that question. Yes, hi. Um, earlier you mentioned that um, organizations can do a lot to help themselves. But then you said that you didn't believe that um, maybe in the concept of self-help. Self and I'm just wondering if you could expand on that a bit. Well, first of all, the bad news. Uh, I think it's very difficult to you know, avoid making mistakes because we're so busy making the mistakes that we don't, you know, we don't monitor ourselves most of the time. And the mistake happened while we're thinking of something else. So that's why I'm skeptical about self-help and all you know, the best we can do, I think, is recognize when you're about to make a mistake and slow down. I was giving earlier the example, there's one situation where all of us do this. Uh, and this is, all of us married people know where you say, if I don't stop myself now, this is going to go on you know, for hours, and it's not going to end well. And, and so you stop yourself now. So th there are, that's wisdom. You know, and and I, I, hope you, I hope you get it uh, before you're 82 years old. Uh, the, now, organizations and why they can do it I'm very impressed looking at organizations. I've been doing consulting since I finished the book. I haven't gone back to research and doing consulting. And, and I'm really very impressed looking at the procedures that I see, the processes within organizations. And they all have evolved. They all have a history. We've been doing it this way. Before that, we did it that way. And, and there is a history. What you rarely see is you rarely see 
design. That is a procedure that is designed intentionally. You know, somebody is thinking, what is the best way of carrying out this task? And then they organize the activities so that this task gets done. Uh, there are many books about the way Google works, but I think one of them is called How Google Works. And I recommend it because that is an organization that designs a lot of its procedures. Mm -hmm. They think about how best to do it. And then they go ahead and do it that way. And that is something that an individual cannot do. And they allow a lot of thinking time as well for their engineers. They allow a lot of thinking time for their engineers as well, which is, I think, um, questions? Yeah, there's quite a few at the back. Lady with the... I was wondering if you see an increased reliance on instinct in an overly stimulated digital society that is going so fast, and what do you think the implications of that could be? I don't know. That's the phenomenon that's called anchoring. Whoever puts a number on the table in a discussion gains an advantage because people gravitate to that number. I'll give you uh, an example of the psychology behind it. Uh, when you, that's an experiment that was done with German judges. Um, it, it's spectacular. I'm not entirely sure it's right, but it's got, you, you'll see the idea. So those are real judges, but they are sort of in a play situation, in an experimental situation. And they're asked to roll a die. No, they're asked to look at a case and then to roll a die and then to decide on how many months of jail are appropriate to that case. Not one die, two dice. And, and the dice are loaded so that in fact, say you, the total is either nine or four. Now it turns out that with the same story, the same case, judges give a harsher sentence if the die is show nine than if the die is show three. That's absurd. It's a phenomenon of anchoring. All, everybody should know about anchoring because anchoring happens when you're negotiating over the, the sale of your house. Mm -hmm. The asking price is an anchor. And the asking price may have nothing to do with reality, but it's an anchor and it's influential even when it's ridiculous. So knowing that, when somebody mentions a number, if you know about anchoring, you say, I'm not going to take that number seriously. In fact, when I was teaching negotiations, I would tell my students, if somebody gives a number that, that is ridiculous, you make a scene. You say, I will not leave that number on the table. I don't want to discuss with that number in the background. Take the number away. Let's start over. Uh, anchoring is a really powerful phenomenon. Most people are susceptible to it. You can recognize when it happens, and when it happens, you can block it. There aren't many examples like that, but some are. I'm going to Morocco uh, in about two weeks' time. I'd love for you to come with me so you can negotiate for the handbags that I'm going to buy uh, for the missus. But so basically, when, when I'm going into um, a, a salary review, the first number I should say is a million, is, is my expectation. Well, I mean, I you don't want ridiculous anchors. There, there are, there's a debate. If you're going to, if you're going to be too obvious, yeah. then it's not going to work. But you want it to be more or less credible, there is a big advantage. In negotiations, there is a, a big advantage in going first, mm -hmm. in giving the first number. And the advantage is due to anchoring. Mm -hmm. That is, you put a, a number there, and it comes, it links to something that I talked about. When you, you hear that number, you try to make sense of it. What would it mean? 
And once you've made, you've tried to make sense of it, you're influenced by it. That's the way the mind works. Great question. Thank you very, very much. Um, yes, right at the front here, please. It's on the way. Um, with all the cognitive biases that we have as human beings, um, do we really make our own decisions? Well, you know, you're freer. You can be freer when you're slow. When you're fast, when you're fast, things happen to you. You don't necessarily make them happen. They happen. And you have less control over fast thinking than over slow thinking. I guess I'm wondering if you have a point of view on how consumers are uh, likely to react to that kind of marketing going forward because it's more and more about personalization and customization and companies almost deciding for consumers uh, what offers they may get. And I'm wondering if, you're, if you have any point of view on whether or not consumers may become more sophisticated in that type of environment or if they'll become more lazy in terms of how they evaluate those offers. So the, when you have a recommendation system and it pops up with things that are plausible and, and you have a few experiences with it and they tell you you like it and you actually like it, uh, that, that is extremely difficult to resist. And, and I'm, I don't see that people will resist it. So I would assume that this trend will continue because, because, in, because in fact people are lazy and if somebody knows what I'm going to like, and I believe them, because I've, I've learned to trust them, I'll trust them. I don't see where the reaction is going to come from. Final question. It's the lady at the back there. Thank you. Hi, thanks for your remarks today. It's been really enlightening. Um, question for you. Knowing that consumers are likely to be thinking fast when they're shopping, what is our responsibility as marketers? You know, this, what the ethics are of marketing, you know, that's, that is beyond me. You know, when, when is, <coughs> when do you, is the boundary cross? between trying to influence and, and defrauding. No, those are, I, I, I have no way of answering this. But clearly, you know, that's an issue that arises. It arises, by the way, at all levels. Uh, the whole issue of how to influence people is now very much being debated all over the place. It's, it's come up in the context of nudges, of what governments can do to influence citizens. The design of decisions, uh, the design of uh, information that consumers will get. Uh, this question is everywhere. What are the boundaries of appropriate influence? And, and whether there are ethical standards you probably recognize as a profession, you know, as professionals, what you consider acceptable and when, what you don't. Whether it is useful to formalize it and to make it explicit is more of a political question. I'm just about to hand over back over to Erica, but uh, if I can, I'd just like to say thank you to uh, you all uh, for some great questions and being here. And I'd also, it's a personal honor of mine to, uh, to interview uh, Daniel Kahneman, his uh, noble highness. Uh, so if we can all just give him a massive thank you and round of applause, thank you. Thank you.